You know, reading the Bible and taking its stories at face value seems to make some pretty outlandish claims. Talks about a recent creation some 6,000 years ago. The first humans created as humans and only one simple instruction given. Don't eat the fruit on this one tree. A talking snake asked the two first humans, did God really say that? Science would surely say that all the stories in the Bible were impossible nonsense. You know, the science that brought you microwave ovens, the internet, space travel, and amazing modern miracles of medicine. The science that says the earth is billions of years old. The science that says we humans evolved over many millions of years from ape-like creatures. The science that brought us the Big Bang and the dinosaurs. Which science says aren't even mentioned in the Bible. And that science says we have the fossils right here to show it. But did science really say this? Join me in this odyssey as we spend dozens of hours exploring the controversy of creation and revolution in this exhaustive series I call The Complete Creation. Thank you for joining me. My name is Ian Juby. I am the host and producer of the weekly television show Genesis Week and the founder of Canada's first museum devoted to biblical creation. I've spent close to 30 years now studying this creation evolution controversy, speaking on the topic, and conducting a lot of collaborative research with scholars and scientists from around the world as well as my own scientific investigations into the matter. You see, I love science. Started teaching it when I was 16 years old. I also love my creator, whom I would contend is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. But I can't say I was always like that. It's a long story, but there was a time when I rejected Christ and was so angry with both him and the words written in this book that I repeatedly whipped it against the wall in fits of rage. Maybe that's where you're at today. And I get it. I really do. Having such a, a keen interest in anything science and tech, and also educated right here in North America, I was taught the exact same things the majority of you were undoubtedly taught. Evolution was a fact. Science says so. I was handed boatloads of alleged evidence for evolution. Undoubtedly, there will be many of you watching this series, you are convinced of evolution as a scientific fact. Again, I get it. I get where you are coming from. I realize I may seem like an extreme oddity when I say that, in spite of my own personal history, I have scientifically rejected evolution and embraced this book, as a literal history book of life, the universe, and everything. Now, I understand why some of you will look at me like I'm some kind of conspiracy nut who also has two heads or something. I get it. After all, how can you deny science? But let me start right there. This simple chart we've all seen, so eloquently depicting the fossil evidence of the evolutionary ascent of ape-like creature to man, the vast majority of people do not know that this fossil sequence is only found in three places on the entire planet. Do any of you know where we find this sequence? Only three places. Textbooks, museum displays, and the imaginations of people. This sequence does not exist in physical form anywhere on this planet. In fact, if you were to accurately depict in graphical form what we actually find, it would look like this. And 
the interpretation of many of the alleged half-ape, half-human fossils are controversial even among die-hard adherents to evolution. In a later session, you'll see the evidence for yourself and we'll take a close look at many of these fossils, uh, looking at replications and 3D scans of the original fossils. As a matter of fact, you'll get to see that some of these alleged half-ape, half-human ancestors really are half-ape, half-human because they mixed human fossils with ape fossils to reconstruct these skeletons. They made a Frankenstein chimera and then claimed it to be proof of evolution. How could science be so wrong? Now, being a vocal proponent of true science, I would like to start this series right there because we can't determine what science says or does not say until we even know what science is. And unfortunately, there's an incredible amount of ignorance on that very topic. I lay the responsibility for that at the feet of the self-proclaimed science educators. PBS, National Geographic, uh, the National Center for Science Education, Bill Nye the Science Guy, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, and the likes. Interestingly, with each of these individuals or groups, you can see their historic descent into madness when they attempt to defend the theory of evolution. They inevitably contradict and otherwise refute themselves while proclaiming bold statements that reveal their glaring ignorance on what science even is. This descent into madness happens because, as you will see shortly, in order to defend the theory of evolution, you must deny true science. Let me give you some examples so we can learn what science is and is not. Now, a couple of years back, I saw a meme on the internet. An alleged quote attributed to Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. I'll be honest with you. When I first saw the meme and read the quote, this is the meme that came to mind. Like the Abraham Lincoln meme, I honestly figured some internet troll had made what he thought was a profound argument, slapped deGrasse Tyson's name on it to give it authority, uh, the alleged quote was profoundly nonsensical. I didn't actually believe DeGrasse Tyson said this until I saw and heard him say it. It was during an interview with left-wing extremist Bill Meyer on Real Time, produced by HBO. Now, we're not going to rehash what we talked about on the panel last week. We debated global warming. Two of the people did not believe in it. Oh, no, one person didn't believe it. Two of them didn't believe in evolution. Uh, you know, the good thing about science is that it's true whether or not you believe in it. You see, that's the, <laughs> the thing. That's very good. But notice the subtlety of Meyer bringing up evolution and deGrasse Tyson then sneakily swapping out the word evolution and replacing it with the word science. He then swaps out the word science for the word truth. This is significant. deGrasse Tyson butchers science as a whole with a completely nonsensical statement that betrays his apparent ignorance on what science is and is not. The reaction and applause of both Meyer and the audience betrays their apparent ignorance on the topic as well. Science cannot be truth. Science is a tool, a process. Let's swap out the word science for other common tools or processes so you can grasp the error of Dr. deGrasse Tyson's ways. The good thing about carpentry is that it's true whether or not you believe in it. The good thing about a hammer is that it's true whether or not you believe in it. The good thing about baking is that it's true whether or not you believe in it. The good thing about homogenizing milk is that it's true whether or not you believe in it. What deGrasse Tyson said is literally nonsense. Let me ask Dr. deGrasse Tyson one question. Is science self-correcting? 
Now, anyone who knows anything about science knows that the correct answer is a resounding yes. Even militant anti-creationists shout this claim from the rooftops. Well-known scientists and educators, usually proponents of evolution, have commented eloquently on this fact. In the 1985 show Cosmos, Carl Sagan said, Science is not perfect. It can be misused. It is only a tool, but it is by far the best tool we have. Self-correcting, ongoing, applicable to everything. It has two rules. First, there are no sacred truths. All assumptions must be critically examined. Arguments from authority are worthless. Second, whatever is inconsistent with the facts must be discarded or revised. The obvious is sometimes false. The unexpected is sometimes true. I'd like to suggest that Dr. deGrasse Tyson chew on the words of Ian Tattersall, Curator Emeritus at the American Museum of Natural History. In science, it is no crime to be wrong unless you are inappropriately laying claim to truth. What matters is that science as a whole is a self-correcting mechanism in which both new and old notions are constantly under scrutiny. In other words, the edifice of scientific knowledge consists simply of a body of observations and ideas that have, so far, proven resistant to attack and that are thus accepted as working hypotheses about nature. So tell me, if science is truth, then that would mean the truth is self-correcting. So the truth that was is no longer the truth because it was clearly incorrect and not the truth, and it corrected itself. So what deGrasse Tyson currently thinks this truth is today may not be truth to him next week in light of new evidence. Therefore, the truth is not the truth, according to Dr. deGrasse Tyson's self-contradicting statement. I have bad news for Dr. deGrasse Tyson. The truth is true, whether or not you believe in it. Now, Dr. deGrasse Tyson is a smart guy, so why would he say something so foolish? Why did this happen? I'm certain many of you will be surprised, even shocked, because you will see that the theory of evolution, from its foundations to its application in modern times, is the antithesis of science. To defend the anti-science dogma of evolutionism, without even realizing it, you fall into illogical and irrational rhetoric. You must reject true science and embrace the science falsely so-called, that the Apostle Paul mentioned. I might remind everyone that Paul was an apostle who originally rejected Jesus Christ, the Christ who stood before Pontius Pilate. As Pilate was standing in judgment of Christ, he asked, What is truth? Pilate asked this as he stood before the Christ who had previously said, I am the truth. Science is not truth. Science is a study of the world around us, and in its purest form, is a pursuit of finding out what is the truth. However, science has limitations. Uh, for example, science is strictly limited to the natural realm. It cannot measure or study your emotions or even your thoughts. We cannot scientifically study what is outside of nature, though scientific study may point to the extra natural. For example, it may come as a shock to my evolutionist friends that you believe in the supernatural. Molecules demand evolution, popularly taught at all levels of education, must violate several well-established scientific laws of nature, such as biogenesis and the second law of thermodynamics. Well, if a process violates a scientific law of nature, then by definition it is neither scientific nor natural. It is an extra-natural, a.k.a. supernatural process. A miracle! <laughs> Molecules demand evolution, by very definition, is a supernatural process, flying in the face of all observable science. Now, you are welcome to contend that the first life arose from non-life, but that is not scientific. 
that violates the law of biogenesis established by observation since the beginning of scientific study. You would be venturing beyond what science can study because life has only ever been observed to arise from previous life. Now, the theory of special creation and the theory of evolution both inevitably venture into the supernatural, beyond the realm of scientific study. Creation and evolution are both attempts to use science to answer the four great questions of life. Who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going? The two models of creation or evolution exhaust all other possibilities. Our origins will be found in one of these two models. Uh, for example, there are some who claim that we were genetically engineered here on Earth by aliens. Well, that's well and all, but it does not answer the question, where did we come from? It dodges the question. It merely brings up the question, where did the aliens come from? And it fails to answer that question. Either those aliens were created or they evolved. Now, in defining what evolution is, I find myself having to define the type of people I address as well. I have many friends who believe in the theory of evolution. Why wouldn't they? <laughs> they were taught as I was, given years of education on the alleged overwhelming evidence for evolution. Now, these people I have great respect for, as they are typically very interested in true science. They have not heard the information I'm about to share with you in this video series. So why on earth would they believe anything else? All of this evidence for evolution is probably racing through your minds already. You are the people I make this series for. I know you are addicted to information and appreciate it, as do I. So I hope you'll stick it out because when I first came across this information, I was frankly angry. I asked questions like, why have I not heard this before? It rattled my cage, shook up my life. It made me angry because I felt like some big secret had been kept from me. But there was no one person I could blame. Nobody was out there deliberately hiding things from me. They hadn't heard this information either, even though it's all out there. But it took someone else who was in my current shoes to bring it all to my attention. As you will see, the evidence against evolution is frankly overwhelming. Then there are those people I call anti-creationists. These are people for whom evolution is quite literally a religion. They embrace and defend it religiously and quite viciously attack any who dare question evolution. They attack any who would dare present any of the overwhelming scientific evidence refuting evolution, like I am about to do in this series. Attacking those who present scientific evidence is by definition anti-science behavior. And I have to deal with these incredibly rude people on a daily basis. So if I come across as a little harsh sometimes, please bear in mind, I have no patience for the enemies of the truth. I'm getting old and crotchety, and it's the same old boring and pathetic attacks day in, day out. You'll see as I quote such people throughout this video series, because their ridiculous comments often do bring up good talking points to further demonstrate how the evolution myth is just that, an anti-science myth. My resulting rants may or may not be tempered by how much happy juice I have drank that day. Depending on how much happy juice I drink during these recordings, I may or may not be inspired to rant. Oh, and when I refer to happy juice, I'm referring to energy drinks. I don't know what your reprobate minds were thinking. Anyway, before I continue, I find I must define the theory of evolution, partly because it's been muddied, sometimes unintentionally, other times maliciously so. Whenever I refer to the theory of evolution or evolution in this series, I'm referring to the common molecules to man version that is taught in our Western education system. 
There is microevolution and macroevolution, uh, two very different things. And the anti-creationists often muddy the waters between the two, even going so far as to denying that there are two different kinds. Uh, for example, a very common evidence presented in evolutionary textbooks is the peppered moths. When they rest on light-colored trees, the dark-colored moths stand out and are thus spotted by predators first and eaten. Then, when the Industrial Revolution took place in England and the trees were all darkened from soot, suddenly the lighter colored moths were eaten first and thus the moth population shifted from the majority being dark colored moths. Or so the story goes. Even if that story was actually accurate, it is not, that would be a classic example of microevolution. The peppered moths have evolved into peppered moths. Those are changes within the kind of organism and in the population. But the moths have not evolved, say, a stinger to defend against predators, which requires the generation of new genetic code for multiple organs, such as you know, poison generation and storage, or a stinger with which to administer such poison. This would venture into the realm of macro evolution, major organismal changes which require new genetic information and start to clearly make a new kind of organism. I think we would all agree we would no longer call such a creature a peppered moth. We would call it something with a lot more panache like, you know, death moth with a touch of pepper or something. Now, microevolution is a fact. No one denies this happens. But it is a non sequitur to say that microevolution, which can be observed, leads to macroevolution, which has never been observed in all of scientific history. Macroevolution is what is required by the molecules to man, or universal common ancestry theory of evolution. And I challenge you to find even one observed example in all of scientific history of macroevolution. Throughout this series, unless I specifically say otherwise, whenever I refer to the theory of evolution or evolution, I am referring to the macroevolutionary universal common ancestor theory of evolution. Science is based on several principles. Testability, observation, repeatability, predictability, and falsifiability. So for something to be scientific, it must be observable, repeatable, predictable, and falsifiable. We may not understand how gravity works, but we can sure test and observe its effects. If you fall off a ladder, boy, gravity takes over real quick. You can precisely measure its observed effects. You can predict its effects with surprising accuracy because the effects are repeatable. Falsification is very important in science, and in fact, some would argue that you do not prove something in science. You can only disprove or falsify something with science. Hence the reason it is so important to have ways to be able to falsify a model to demonstrate its plausibility. With the two conflicting models of creation and evolution, we may not be able to prove one model or the other, but we can certainly disprove or falsify one of them. Especially because the two models exhaust all other possibilities, then whichever model remains standing is the one which is most likely correct, scientifically speaking, regardless of whether or not the model ventures into the supernatural. Lastly, in closing, I think it's incredibly important to clarify what science says or does not say. Science says nothing. It is scientists who make claims which are typically based on their interpretation of scientific evidence. Now, as they say, scientists have shown that 87% of the population will believe any claim if they claim that scientists said it. But those scientists are only human. Their claims are limited to their own knowledge, biases, preconceptions, and yes, even errors. 
In the next lecture, we will look more in depth into the scientific evidence we do have that you never seem to hear about. And for one reason or another, many scientists never seem to want to talk about it. Coming up in the next Complete Creation. This is precisely what Lyell did with his catchphrase, the present is the key to the past. In one short sentence, he presented his case and ruled out a historic global flood from the picture without even mentioning it. He replaced history with his story. A story of deep time, millions of years, maybe hundreds of millions of years of present day processes. Now, this is an excellent legal tactic, but is it scientific? <laughs> Hardly. In fact, not only is it unscientific, it's not even pseudoscientific, but rather it is anti-science. Notice he ruled out possible scientific conclusions from consideration and ruled out huge amounts of scientific evidence from the research and modeling before the scientific hypothesis was even formulated. He simply disallowed it. This is the foundation of the modern day beliefs in deep time and long and slow geological processes. It is also the foundation of the evolutionary theory. That very foundation is corrupt and anti-science. Beliefs in deep time are fruit from the poisonous tree. In fact, as you will see shortly firsthand, the present cannot be the key to the past because present day processes cannot explain what we find in the geological record. I would instead contend the Bible is the key to the past. You can catch this entire series in a variety of ways. You can watch the shows online at completecreation.org or genesisweek.com. You can also purchase the Complete Creation series in full high definition on Blu-ray or video on demand at completecreation.org. Or support the Miracle Channel with a monthly tax-deductible donation and access the entire Complete Creation series in high definition through Corco, Miracle Channel's video on demand service. We need your support to keep the program on the air. Please pray for us. And if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to CORE Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, K2K 2P4. Or you can make a donation via PayPal online at ianjuby.org forward slash donations. And thank you for your support.